Imagine for a moment. You are a lone astronaut floating through a dark void of nothingness. Your cable, the only thing connecting you to civilization, everything you know, everything you love, has snapped. You watch your life slowly disappear as you float away from all hope into the darkness. You do nothing because you can do nothing. It is now just you, your thoughts, and the giant unknown as you wait for your oxygen to deplete. Suffocation seems like a blessing compared to the purgatory you find yourself in as you float further into nothingness. In a matter of mere seconds, the absence of breathable air would undo some consciousness. And after a mere 90 seconds, you would be dead, floating off into the depths of absolute nothingness. I've been scared of space ever since I was a child. My grandpa was the first one to introduce me to the world beyond ours. Even when I was younger, I understood that he was a very educated man. Whenever I entered his room, I could see bookshelves filled with dictionaries. He loved spending time with me, and he would use every opportunity he had to educate me about the things he knew, in what I now guess was his hope of infusing me with some of the passion he felt. Life had been unnecessarily tough on him. He spent most of his childhood fleeing the monsters of the war, and when he did manage to settle down, he was barely educated enough to hold down a job at a railway company. Company. The security of a steady job must have been calming for somebody who was on the move for his entire life. It wasn't his passion, but he was exceeding at his job. But there was a part of him that looked back at the life he could have had. It must have killed him. Later that year, on what I recall to be my eighth ever Christmas, I would receive a gift from my family that was intended to further that fascination with the stars. It was the biggest gift I'd ever received, and I couldn't wait to dive deeper into the world of my third biggest passion. <laughs> right next to dinosaurs and Lego Ninjago, I would soon position it on the window of my grandmother's house that was blessed with the highest altitude, and waited eagerly for the night to arrive. Hour by hour passed, until the blue sky turned into a dark tone, covered in white, glowing dots. I'd waited for this since, like, forever. As my eye approached the designated area, the realization started setting in that what I was looking at wasn't a theoretical thing. It was real. All the little white dots were incredibly complex physical phenomena. I felt like a deer in headlights, quite literally starstruck by what I was looking at. It felt like the abyss was gazing right into my soul. This gave my eight-year-old self a lot to think about that night. In sci-fi operas like Star Wars or Frank Herbert's Dune, space is seen as just another obstacle that humanity is destined to overcome like we once conquered the seas. These just societies have advanced so much that the traversal of the vacuum is barely even thought over. A mostly glorious future in which space travel ushered in a new golden age for humanity. Interstellar is not one of those futures. It's a bleak outlook. Earth has almost run out of all resources and even though some form of peace has been achieved, it's not going to last long if no solution to the drying of food supply is found. It tells the story of the retired army pilot Cooper, who has to leave Earth and his family behind, aided by the remaining members of NASA to find a potential future for humanity on a different planet, many universes away. Among his family is his daughter Murphy, who very much doesn't want her father to leave. She's a child, but she's very aware of the dangers an expedition like this would bring, and that in most cases, her father most likely won't return. But Cooper needs to leave. Each step that he takes past the boundaries that nature set for us, he has to rely on the ingenuity of human engineers. If any parts fail, he's on his own. And it's pretty clear he would come out on top in the struggle of a lone astronaut against a vacuum of space. In the medieval worldview of geocentrism, Earth is the axis of which the universe revolves around. A central point. The idea that however far we might venture out into uncharted territory, there is something we can rely on. We would soon find out that that wasn't true. We are just an unremarkable part of something much bigger. So infinite, and every single new discovery we make about the universe just hammers that point in. In space exploration, there's a thing called space adaptation syndrome. When astronauts first try to adjust to the effects of space, the body thinks that it is under the effects of a poison. It starts with nausea, then dizziness and fatigue starts to set in. Headaches, cold sweats, sensory changes, and a loss of appetite. You name it. All signs from bodies that this environment isn't made for us, and that we don't belong here. Leaving Earth is final, 
as in that even if you did return, it wouldn't be the same as he once knew. During Cooper's journey, he has to land on a planet that sits on the brink of a black hole, and due to the time dilation caused by the shift of gravity, one hour on the planet is equal to seven years on Earth. While this story in Interstellar isn't real, the maths is. When Cooper does manage to return to his daughter, she's different. Murphy is now far past the age Cooper had left her. She is on a deathbed, aching to see her father one last time. I know I can't be the only one who would lie awake at night trying to comprehend just how big the universe was, with the total awareness that I would never be able to even grasp any of it. Infinity is scary. It's beyond us. Humans have no use for it in their day-to-day -day life, bigger than anything we can imagine. The idea that we only have each other is kind of scary. The thought that the people you rely on need to have your best in mind. Oh, well, there's a slight issue. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Our ancestors hunched that something has to be watching us doesn't surprise me when you take a deeper look at the night sky. I mean, we can't be the only ones. But really, what's more frightening? The idea that it's really only us? Or that there is something out there waiting? In the movie Alien, the titular entity is terrifying. Designed by H. L. Geiger, his catalogue of art provides only a guess at what a being from another universe might look like. It's not a short green man, or a tall humanoid shape consisting of grey goo. No. The alien is the representation of the unknown, a Lovecraftian entity making a man go mad at the sheer sight of its incomprehensible nature. Over the course of the story, each crew member of the ship that was unfortunate enough to intentionally or not stumble onto the planet that holds these creatures is systematically wiped out. Each one trying a different approach at defeating the monster, but each one failing because they assume it was made in an environment like ours. That tricks we used to defeat a wild animal on Earth would apply to something that was forged in a foreign realm. Because we do have a bad habit of attempting to ascribe some kind of human element to things we don't really understand. They're just like us. They want to know what makes us tick. They want to know us so they can kill us. In the film, they don't just do an impeccable job at making the monster utterly frightening but showing it at just the right times, covering it in enough smoke and shadows that the true monster is only partly real. The rest is left up to our imagination. The thought alone that the alien might be out there and might be resilient enough to survive even the worst of explosions and maybe even show its face. It's terrifying. The alien again, at least hopefully, isn't real. But the thought behind it is worrying. What if there is a being out there that defies our expectations? An apex predator whose interest in our problems is so concerningly low and who's so indifferent to anything we could engineer that it would be like an ant colony trying to escape a tank. Even worse, what if the threat isn't alive at all? There are obvious ones like black holes, which, as terrifying as they are, could at least be predicted. Asteroids, solar flares, gamma rays, vacuum decay, even our own sun is going to burn out eventually. And when you consider that we're not really sure of what's out there, even the main idea of space exploration seems futile and utterly pointless. I mean, why should we pump our finite resources out into orbit in an attempt to explore the stars when we ourselves haven't really figured out the problems we face on Earth? Is what's out there to conquer really new information and materials? Or is it just a symptom of our selfish drive to satisfy our own curiosity? I was going on a walk through the outskirts of the lovely German town I live in the other day, and as the sun had already dawned, and as I had not brought any form of entertainment with me, I couldn't help but return to all the thoughts I'd stored away as I wandered under the night sky. I thought about my grandfather. I hadn't spoken to him in over 10 years at that point. Time only gave me the little I saw as infinite when I was younger. It's weird to think about it, but I think he died happily. Think about how all the sacrifice he made will live on. That I will progress and work towards my children, and children's children's children, will have a better world to live in than he did. We are all made up of atoms. Fundamentally, we're the same as every space rock we can find. But not a single one of them is anything even remotely as impressive as us, life. That's what makes us stand out. We haven't found anything even quite like us, and we probably won't anytime soon. In less than 12,000 years, we've gone from being cavemen to landing on the moon, from hunters and gatherers hiding under rocks to us building skyscrapers for fun. And it's not like we're gonna stop here. I mean, why stop at the moon? <laughs> I mean, I mean, really, what's the point of life if we don't develop and really reach for the stars? Maybe nothing matters, but maybe that's a good thing. It may be true that as homo sapiens do have some more than wacky tendencies, but that's what makes life, life.